And we're live. Hey guys, we'll just give everybody a, a couple of minutes to, to find their seats, let's say. But, uh, and their seats. Let's <laughs> 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 you know, hope they're in their seat. <laughs> getting into this, you know, virtual <laughs> event, you know, it's, it's been a year, man. It's been a long year. Uh, but uh, how are both of you guys doing? Reva, how are you? Doing good. Found my seat. That brought me back to like, yeah, being in a big conference room and trying to find a seat. That's nice. It's very nostalgic. I know. <laughs> I know. I was just thinking, oh, how good would it be if, you know, we were just on stage somewhere? I mean, ah. but I mean, look, this is the biggest stage we could hope for, the digital stage, you know, you get in front of way more people. It's much more in, like interactive, engaging, you know, but uh, yeah. How are you, Morgan? You keeping well? Great. Yeah. I feel like I'm going to be awkward when I get back on stage again. I'm going to not know what to do. <laughs> With your hands. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, hey, guys, can you comment in the chat? It's like, oh, wait, there is no chat. Like, oh, y'all are here. Like, it's just going to be weird. But I'm, I'm great. I'm doing good. That's Yeah. I, I really wonder how that's going to work, like, the first couple of times. If it's just going to be, like, you get on stage and you just start flowing again, or is it going to be, like, utter panic? You know? <laughs> I feel like it's just going to be awkward. <laughs> Yeah, you just can be yeah, like, yeah. Oh, what do I really say here? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's the question as well. How is it, like how events are going to be, how they're going to be for the next year or so anyway. I reckon it's going to be another while before people feel comfortable just going to events. Like even with vaccinations and everything, I think people are just, I think it'd just be something scratching at the back of people's minds a little bit. Oh, big rooms full of people that hasn't been allowed for a while. Is that still okay for me to do? You know, I think it's going to take a bit of time for people to get over that. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. But guys, we've got uh, we've got over 100 on now, and uh, it's it's still going up. But I think we can probably get started, guys. Really great to have everybody back. Uh, I, I put welcome back here as the first time because it's actually our officially first webinar of 2021. So uh, Lee Peter, uh, along with all of our amazing guests last year, we did I think 16 or 17 webinars across the space last year, starting from around March. Um, Morgan is a second time guest in this webinar, so welcome back, Morgan uh reva first time guest but also coming from vidyard uh Vidyar is a, a very good friend of this webinar let's say and uh yeah so really happy to, to have both vidyard and uh morgan back on again so welcome guys Thank good to be you. back i made the cut <laughs> <laughs> it was tough man it was a tough call to be honest with you you know we, we really you know we, we there was a lot of a lot of stuff uh discussed behind closed doors man but you made it congratulations <laughs> Here we are. But, uh, <laughs> so just just some housekeeping stuff, guys. If anybody has any questions at all, please just drop something into the Q and A tab or putting them in, uh, something into the chat. Um, like we'll be going through quite a bit of content, but please feel free to drop something in. Probably what we'll do is if the guys are going through content, I will stop them uh, when when uh, when it seems fit and ask them the question that might come from somebody in the audience. We will at the end have a Q and A session, which will probably last around fifteen minutes. That, of course, can go on a little bit longer depending on everybody's time. But um, if you do have any questions, we'll try to cover them as, as best we can towards the end. But if there is something that's super pushing to read, please just put it into the chat box, uh, chat box or uh, into the Q&A tab. So just before we get started, we both we, we know that this uh, webinar is about video. Uh, we've just launched from Leadfeeder an ebook around uh, video selling in 2021 uh, with some very big names in video. So Vidyard, Hippo, Video, and Loom. Uh, if you haven't gotten your hands on this ebook yet, you can do so now. Uh, Johnny from the, uh, from the Lead Feeder marketing team is going to pop a link into the chat tab now in a few moments. So bookmark that, get your hands on that ebook. So just getting started uh, today, what are we going to be discussing? So Morgan, the last time you were on, we were talking about uh, top of funnel stuff, how we get connected with prospects, you know, um, and, and now we want to focus a little bit further down the funnel using video. Um, so what we want to focus on is, is how you can accelerate pipeline by using video. Um, I think it's uh, both of the guests that we have on today have a very unique view on this, also from the vendor side, so being from Reva side, but also somebody that, you know, they eat their own dog food over a video and that they use it in their day to day business. And also, Morgan, I think every I, when I think of any of the sales influencers that I see on LinkedIn that probably has the biggest voice when it comes to talking about video, it will be you. So I'm really, really interested to see what you're going to deliver today in terms of what people can offer from a video perspective. Just uh, in terms of who we have on the lineup today. So I'll be moderating things, but you won't hear my voice too much. Thankfully, says most of you. 
but uh, we'll hand it over to our <laughs> we'll hand it over to our our two guests. So we have uh, Morgan J Ingram, who's from JB Sales Training. Morgan's got like extensive experience in uh, in in not only selling, having worked at companies such as Terminus, for example, but he's also uh, he's also been a sales trainer for a number of years. Also works uh, quite a bit in the in the charity field. I would call it maybe not charity, Morgan, but more so charity uh, field. <laughs> Not charity, but like you, ha- you work with the with the organization to help uh, to help people that are in sales, the young black black people that are in sales to 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 move forward to the next level, uh, which is super impressive. And and to be honest with you, the content that you're pushing out on a on a daily basis on LinkedIn is inspirational to say the least. Massive amount of engagement. You spend a huge amount of time pushing yourself via your podcasts, via muffins with Morgan last year. Super interesting content. So uh, yeah. Morgan J. Ingram, ladies and gentlemen. Um, after, after Morgan, we have Reva. So Reva actually comes from a selling side herself. So she actually works in sales for Idiard on the, on the, on the vendor side. Uh, super interesting career as well, from what I can see from, from your LinkedIn as well, Reva. Started out as a, as a, a dance teacher, super interesting. <laughs> but then going to, to, to larger, larger, larger companies, let's say, working with Oracle Marketing Cloud in the educational space there. That's a super complex sale uh, working for Oracle Marketing Cloud. They're multi, like very, very multi-million dollar deals they can turn into with, with such an enterprise sale. Um, and you've been with Vidyard now for almost six years, which is also super impressive. In the tech space to say, to stay with one company in the tech space for almost six years, that's, uh, that's very impressive. Uh, and I'm uh, super interested to hear and, uh, how you've managed to stay within the same company for that amount of time. It's, it's really, really interesting. So guys, uh, first up, we have Morgan. Um, and uh, I'm going to hand things over to Morgan now. But again, great to have you on, Morgan. Really looking forward to hearing the content, mate. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we're going to dive into a lot of different components when it comes to video. And I'm going to talk about all different angles of it. Like there will be some places where you can use it as a place to get prospecting and get meetings, but also you can use it to accelerate pipeline. And again, we're gonna talk about a lot of different things here. I'm, I'm curious before we even dive in this conversation, we have about a hundred people on this call here today. How many of you all have been using video? If you have been like, Hey, you've used video and tell us a little bit about that in the chat here. And then if you haven't used video or maybe you're hesitant about it, also tell us if you are as well. Um, I just want to get an understanding of where everyone is at uh, so we can figure out what's going on. Uh, some of you, again, may be like all in and you're starting to see results. Uh, maybe this is something that is on your radar and you just maybe don't know where to start. Or again, like James had put here, he put never. So again, we'd love to see what everyone's comments see here in the chat. Now, as I talk about this, uh, we're going to talk about how to increase connect rates with the video what's really important for everyone is when we give this information that there there is no silver bullets and there is no magic formula so if you make a video right after this and you don't get a response like it's a consistent effort just like when you did your first call someone probably didn't pick up like you sent your first personalized email maybe they didn't reply it's the same thing here does it take a little bit of effort yes yep but we, what we've seen is if you take this little bit of effort it leads the results. And so that, that's what leads into what I want to dive into here is I really want to talk about this formula. And you see it on the cold video side. However, it's applicable to any type of video that you make within the sales process. And for those of you who want to dive deeper into understanding how this works and how you can execute it, this is it right here. So, you know, we see a lot of people here in the chat talking about they've played around with it. Uh, they've used it in different angles. They talked, they get a lot of different things here. And one thing, again, I just want to just talk about and dive into is this formula and how you could execute it on all angles of what you're doing. So for those of you who are looking to schedule net new meetings, or you're looking to follow up with someone, if you follow this formula, you'll notice that this keeps the video tight. And the goal in the video, and I was just talking to someone two days ago on this, they said it they feel overwhelmed and they end up creating four or five minute videos. So that's a, that's a lot of information, right? Like, I don't even know if I want to watch a four or five minute video of someone I know, right? 
So the whole goal here is when you're creating this video, you have to put barriers on this video so then you're able to deliver it in a very impactful way, which is why I took a step back and created this 10, 30, 10 formula years ago and consistently have been coaching and training others on this. You'll notice that it's good for prospecting. It's also good for follow-ups. And the best way to think about a video is always to refer it as a movie trailer. And, I, and again, I want everyone to really, as you as you got in your seat, as, as Andy said, that you, you're not, as you're That's taking just note. Jack Morgan has everybody taking a seat. I don't know, but they might not have. They might still be standing. Who knows? So if you got in your seat, then you need to figure out, okay, like how can I make this a movie trailer? How can I make this appealing? The goal of the video is to add an extra umph to what you're doing as that touch right and so because you're adding that extra umph to it that personality people are now going to be way more bought into whatever you're saying because it's, it's as if you're having a face-to-face -face conversation that we may not have for quite a while we're not, we're not going to probably go to events right face-to-face -face meetings in the office so if i can do this right and you can hear me you can feel me completely different perspective moving forward. And so again, what you see here from this 10, 30, 10 is a breakdown of how anyone on this webinar right now can take this information and go execute. So in the first 10 seconds, you want to state the reason for the video. Just because we're talking about video here today, and Reva is going to give us some amazing insights too. You can't be like, Hey, what up? It's me. <laughs> I made a video, so you should respond. I took the time to make it. So what up? No, don't do that. All right. If anyone walks out of this webinar and does that, you, nope, that's not what we talked about. All right. Don't, don't put it on us. So the whole thing here is you have to have a reason of why you're reaching out. If you have no reason to make making the video, then you shouldn't even click make the video at all. So what are those reasons that you can reach out? Well, there's one is you could go look on someone's LinkedIn website if you're an enterprise 10k report if you're following up with something maybe you saw something in your notes that you can use as a reference point you want to be able to set the intention right in the beginning and state the reason of why you're reaching out and what's why should people be listening to you in the first place if you're able to do that people are going to be way more bought in to hear out what you have to say so every single video and what i've seen is starting the reason for my video is and this feedback comes directly from buyers. Like I'll ask people when they reply to videos, like what made you watch the video? Like I'm, I'm genuinely curious about that. So as you make videos, Hey, you're hearing it from us, but also talk to your buyers. Hey, what was the reason you responded to this? And a lot of people said, Hey, it was because you started off with the reason for my video is so you knew you had a reason. And so I listened all the way through it. And it's these little things that matter. And that's why I'm pointing it out here. The 30 seconds is the value prop essentially, or the attention grabber. And all you're doing here is you're offering up a solution based on what you found. So if you're following up with somebody that maybe is already in the pipeline, maybe they've gone dark, Hey, give them a reason to pop back on the call. Right. And you should know from your notes there, if you're inside of a deal, if it's a cold video, then use something from your cold call that you can then insert in there in that 30 seconds. And then the last 10 seconds is the call to action. So typically what we see across the board is you want to have something called an interest call to action. As you see here, are you open to learning more? Are you curious to take a deeper dialogue on this topic? These are questions that you can ask to get people to feel more engaged with you and then just have a conversation, which is the goal at the end of the day. So 10, 30, 10 is what essentially we're focused on here. And if you take this formula that I've been giving you, this could help solve a lot of things that's going on. So Jess, you know, just started using prospecting. Hopefully this helps you here, right? That gets you right into the flow. Some people are making videos on a website might be a little bit different, right? But you could use this framework to find videos that are captivating. Uh, we see videos that you people are using for follow-up. People are using it to maybe customer success outreach. Yeah. We have people who do this as well, right? We have a director of customer success. She follows the same formula. So this allows you to keep the video tight within 45 to 60 seconds. We're not trying to make the next motion picture over here. All right. We're not in studio, right? Trying to create the next Marvel movie. All right. All we're doing is creating a quick movie trailer, grab your interest and get you intrigued, right? So now you've done that, whether 
you're doing a cold outbound video or you're doing the follow-up. Now I want to get just really tactical here and share five things that will help you, you know, be successful here and get you some results. This is the most important one out of all of them. And, and I say this a lot and I think people laugh when I say it. I mean, it is funny, but you need to make sure that you smile on the thumbnail because if someone sends you something and they're not smiling, you don't know them, it's probably not going to end up too well for you because no one's going to click it. So from all the videos that we've seen to be successful versus smile or non-smile, we've seen that the pe when people smile, it completely changes the way that they perceive you. They see you as a welcoming, warm person, because if you're just frowning or you look upset, then yeah, why would I click that video? So take the time to smile in your thumbnail, look presentable so people are willing to engage with you. So this is also a really big one, like prepare the flow beforehand. I, I think this is one of the most critical pieces here from a tactic standpoint. So let's say that, hey, I'm making videos and some of you are like, it's taking me way too long. So one thing you could do is have a standard procedure of what you need to do, right? So you could be like, all right, this is the flow of how my follow-up videos should go. This is the flow of my cold calling videos. So when you have a flow, I don't like calling them scripts. I just call it a flow. Then you know exactly what you do need to say. And then you can add context to that. So it's really important to have a framework of content that you should cover and then provide context based on what you found by insights or what you found maybe in that discovery, right? So these are really important things across the board that can be extremely helpful and things across and things. Yeah. So Craig put wave. I also do the, the quick wave too. I'll just show that. Hey, like what up? So that's another thing that you can do as well. It makes you look more welcoming, but really find what your flow is when you're going about your videos. I'm using video later in the cadence as I put here. Uh, third or fourth step is normally what I is typically what I recommend. I think I think one of the things to be very mindful of is th this is me and maybe Reva or even Andy will have comments on this is I tell people not to put video in the first step because what ends up happening is you get could put in spam blacklisted. So I normally recommend people don't do it. However, in a deal, in a sales cycle, you can use video in so many different places. And so like, I'll follow up on that is one of the things that I've been doing as of late to get more engagement inside of a deal. Anybody can do this right now is when you have the decision maker or new parties to the conversation and you're doing a demo. As you walk through that demo, there are going to be people on the call who don't ask you direct questions because there's other people on the call. So instead of, well, I will still sort of follow up to everyone, but I will individually send those people that were on the call a follow-up video. And I'll just be like, hey, great chatting with you yesterday or today or whenever you send the video. Uh, real quick, I want to make the video just so we could connect outside of the conversation. Typically, when there's a big group of people, someone may want to ask me a question, but they may not feel comfortable in that setting. Is there any questions you have for me? Can I address any concerns you had as we went through the conversation? So what ends up happening is people come back to me and they'll be like, yeah, Morgan, thanks for the video. I actually had a question around this. So what I'm doing now is I'm addressing concerns as they have an internal conversation about the product or service that I'm offering to them. So if I can go ahead and proactively handle all these concerns and obstacles without having to really hop on a call and we're just going back and forth and I'm just answering it through video, then I save that person time. I save myself time because I can do more money-making activities and I'm in a way better position than maybe my other person, salesperson who's selling that. And they're not asking for this feedback. So by doing a video, it adds an extra touch to the sales cycle and it allows for more conversation because I'm just, I'm trying to talk to as many people in the account as possible. So that's another tip I want to add to this is that that's a tactic that will lead to results messaging people outside of the conversation one-to-one -one, send them a video tell them hey thanks for the time do you need anything from me it shows that you're being proactive and people appreciate it because that that doesn't really happen that much right and i was it looks like we got that question down there as well um referrals um 11 of sales reps ask for referrals 
So one way that you can go about asking for referrals is sending a video to them and breaking down people that you would like to connect with. And again, that creates another connectivity point. Last thing I'll add is make sure you add context to your video. So whether you're sending it on LinkedIn video or you're sending it through email, one of the things that you can be very, very mindful of here is you wanna say, hey, this is what this video is about. So when you send a video, you just want a quick context point. Hey, I'm sending you a quick 90 second video. Here's what it briefly is gonna be about. So it gets them a little bit interested to go check out those things. So those are five tactics, gave a little bit more on what you could be doing to be successful with video. And that's all I have to say there. I know we want to get Reva time to dive into her components, uh, but I just wanted to start off there so you guys can start moving in that direction. I think we had a couple of questions, but I believe that it got answered. I think Reva, I think you answered most, most of them there. I think Reva's, so. Reva's been jumping in there uh, and uh, answering stuff in the chat there. Morgan, super, super interesting stuff, mate, as always. Uh, I'm, every time I hear the 10, 30, 10, man, I, I love it. It's just, uh, it's, it's such a simple thing, um, but it can make a massive difference. And I, like, I've actually got a couple of questions for you because you're a sales trainer, you work with a number of different clients, uh, like out of your clients, how many of them are, have actually gotten video into their process and are they doing it successfully? Because my feeling right now is videos like this untapped resource i think everybody's talking about it and being like yes video is the next thing but i feel as though not many people are actually doing it how are you seeing that with your clients so there isn't a lot of people doing it which is why it's successful if you consistently do it right yeah. so we, and someone said across all audiences uh we've seen it successful in Europe. I've seen it successful with IT audience, security audience, HR audiences. Like the people I train are like all over the place. So we, we've seen it successful across the board. It really just comes down to the consistency of doing it and the willingness to improve just like anything else. But the people who have done it, I mean, people told me that they've gotten 40% reply rates. You know, one person can contribute a million dollars in pipeline alone just by doing video. Like that's it. Right. And that's not even that's not even including all the other activities they do. So, yeah, no, we've seen massive success with this across the board. And, you know, I, I believe if you can hone in and figure out where it works best for you in your flow and your sales cycle, it will be beneficial, whether it's your post demo follow up, it's your recap, it's your prospecting video. Those are things that you can do to be successful there. Andy. so, yeah, we're seeing a lot of success with it. That's right, man. I, I think like you, you did mention one thing uh, just about like where video fits into your overall cadence. I agree with you that not the first touch, first touch shouldn't be video. I think you need to be, you need to be doing something else for a first touch in terms of a, an outreach cadence. I think it's just, if it's video, you don't really have any, like, as you said, context here in your five tech tactics. There's no real context to it. If it's the first touch, like if I receive a video first time and I'm like, who is this person? I, I, like, <laughs> you know, like it's very rare that I'll click on the, unless like you've done something really personalized in the little gift that I'm getting in the email. Like unless yep. it's super personalized, but typically email is a first touch anyway for me, just doesn't really do it anyway. That's, that's a personal thing with me. I don't yep. know, maybe Reva as well. Like what's, what, what are your thoughts actually on the, on the, um, on the, the first touch and having video appearing in your first touch in a cadence? What do you think? Yeah, it might be because I sell the product I'm using and I'm using the product I sell. So sure. um, I use video as a first touch if I'm prospecting. Um, okay. We do have other people at Vidyard though that choose to use it in a second or third email. Um, I'm for both. I like to lead with my best foot forward. If I have something creative, if I'm gonna have an option of sending someone a text-based email or sending them a very nice personalized video and maybe the content's the same, but the video's got a better chance of like capturing their attention or intriguing them. I'm going with video. It might be though, because I, I sell video. I don't know. <laughs> I would say that you guys probably have a video like all of the best practices. Like I was trying to take a bit of an analogy in my head when you were saying that I was going to say something like you're basically working out of the Willy Wonka chocolate factory when it comes to video, you know, the Willy Wonka video factory. So you have, I guess like, a lot in your armor in terms of what will work, what won't work, which, which I guess a lot of people won't have. 
you know? Yeah. And I mean, we're telling people video cuts through the noise. If I'm not using video to tell you about it, that's. Yes, that's true. <laughs> that's, that's very true. That's also yeah, that's not going to work out. <laughs> not a good that's, choice. That's also but very true. I see some incredible questions coming in from the chat. And so along with what I cover today, Andy, I'd love to like, just make sure I um, reference those too. So uh, could I, could I answer a couple of them before I get in? Shoot, go for it. Okay. What I'll do is let me go to your slide where we see your face and then That's I'll let great. you take over from here on in. I'll, I'll hand you over the remote control. So you've got control of the slides and there you That's go. It's all great. yours. Okay, wonderful. Um, so the first question that came in that I want to chat about is someone asked, you know, are you always starting with like, hey, Jane, it's so and so, are you always doing one to one video? And I think that's a really good question, especially as we get into um, prospecting videos versus full cycle sale videos. Um, so if you're prospecting and you're, you're hitting a tier A account and you're hitting your like key gold persona, I'm going to say do a one-to-one -one video for that person. If however you are, maybe, maybe you're working an account and you want to invite everyone to a webinar that's coming up, you think it's going to help, help them. Like for instance, I sell a lot to our customer base. So I might be reaching out to 10 people on a team telling them about an upcoming webinar. I'm not going to say like, Hey, Jane, join me for this webinar 10 times. I'm probably going to say, you know, hey, Vidyard team, I wanted to share this webinar. And then I'm going to send that video out to multiple people. I think someone brought up like they used video to wish someone a happy holidays. That's one where you could make a single video, make it really nice and send it out over and over again. So there's a time and place for when you do one to one video and when you can repurpose video. However, when we get into like full cycle sales using video past prospecting, that's going to be very specific to the account likely and, and what you're talking about solving with that account. Um, another question that came up from, from AJ in the chat was how do you keep videos concise while addressing key points from the call and next steps? And do you have any tips on that? And I definitely do. So I'll get into into the content and um, actually, you know what, Andy, I don't think I have control yet. Hold on, let me try it again. No? Oh, there we go, I think so. Um, Hold on, two seconds, we'll go again. Now try. There we go. Yeah, there we go. It's all yours. It's all, yours. all right. Thank you. So um, now we're getting past prospecting. It's you've you've got a discovery call set up. Maybe your BDR or SDR like they flipped you. That's an incredible call. Or maybe you're prospecting on your own. You've got a discovery call. The first place that you can use video, I'll start even before like the custom demos and walkthroughs is a handoff video. So if a BDR has like worked so hard to get a demo, a, a call on my calendar, I'm sending out a video as soon as that's booked. And I'm saying, Hey, Morgan, I'm looking forward to our call on Wednesday. Um, I'm so excited. I've just listened to the call you had with Jillian. I love what you're covering on X, Y, Z. Looking forward to answering that question you have. I'm giving them confidence that I'm not just going to jump on this call and be like, Hey, can you rephrase everything you told my, the BDR who you chatted with, because they don't want to do that, right? So I want to give them some confidence, like, I know what you spoke about, and I'm so excited to dive in deeper. And this is what we're going to cover. That's a great, like, 30 second to, to 45 second video, puts a face to the name. It can work to confirm your call. It, it, it serves a few different purposes. So that's number one. And that's an easy one. You could also um, do that one to many. So if you, if you're just getting into video and you, um, you want to test something out, record a single video like, hey, Ray, it's Rava. I'm going to be the account executive speaking with you, looking forward to it. And don't mention their name or their company and just repurpose it over and over again. Every time you get a meeting booked, send that video out. Um, now, let's say you have the discovery call. It's a great call. They want to continue conversations with you. Use a video to summarize what you chatted about. You have to remember people are coming into evaluations where it might not be their biggest priority. They might be just, you know, gathering some information. 
I heard this uh, last week, but you are there to organize the chaos in their head. They have a problem, but like you need to help them kind of like a therapist and you need to make sense of it all and make it easy for them to understand. This is the first time they might be evaluating this, purchasing this. This is the first time they might be working with your company. You wanna make it easy and clear. So maybe you do a little follow-up, you summarize what they, what they chatted about. Something I like to do is I have a lot of micro demo content is what I call it. So if we talked about a particular integration, I'm going to send them a little video that's been pre-created already. I don't need to create it. Just saying, hey, I know we talked about our Salesforce integration. Here's a three minute video on the integration. You might wanna share it with your, your Salesforce admin. You might wanna share it with so-and-so. So this, again, you're using video to make your, to, to like summarize what you've talked about and make it easy for your champion to get you introduced internally, to educate people internally that you might not have been exposed to. This is also super helpful because let's say in two weeks, they need to revisit the content. They can, it's there. And the kicker is as the AE, in two weeks, if I see someone's watching the video again, I know they're revisiting our conversation. Maybe it's a good time for me to check in. Maybe it's a good time if they didn't join a, a follow-up call, I can say, hey, I saw you were checking out the, the summary of what we talked about two weeks ago. Does it make sense to reconnect? So, so these can be really great to keep your deal going and keep engaged with your prospects. Um, I'm going to pause just in case there are questions. I don't want to. A couple of questions. There's, okay. So Phil, Phil was just asking just around uh, using humor in video. I like personally, from my perspective, like it cuts through the noise. If it's good humor, I mean, <laughs> you need to be careful, obviously. Don't. You know. that's, that's what I was going to say. Like, <laughs> you got to, you, you, you just got to know who you're talking to. You yeah, got to know yeah. your audience is and what and how that humor is done. So I, I think yeah. it really depends. I, I don't think it's a bad thing, but you just got to know. Yeah. I think lightheartedness is good, generally. Whether that's humor or, Reva, what do you think? I think if it's on brand for you and you also are reading your audience, it's good. Me personally, I'm not going to tell you a joke or try to be humorous. It's not my personality. I'm more of a... I just want to get things across. I want to make it easy. I think humor can be especially nice in the prospecting part, but once I'm in a deal with you, I'm probably just like kind of um, a bit less humorous, I would say. Now, there's someone on, there's so many humorous like SDRs and BDRs. Tom Boston, who's an SDR from Sales Loft. Yeah. If you haven't seen him on LinkedIn, you have to see his videos, but he, he does some funny stuff. That's his personality. So that's what I expect from Tom. But I'd say use it if you know your audience and it feels good to you. I, I agree there. Like there was, there was another question that was uh, just, uh, sorry, I keep on skipping through your slides here a little bit because I'm trying to control the, uh, the, the chat here as well. But there was actually something here, Reva, that was uh, connected to what you just mentioned there. So uh, this comes from uh, Daniel Harris. Do you ever find people being resistant to receiving a video recap and they want a written recap instead? Good question. Uh, how, how would you navigate around that? Yes. Yeah. So video is just a tool to help you deliver information in a way someone might want it. It might not be the way they want it. And so what I usually do after a discovery call is I will summarize. I, I have like a, a template I use. Here's the summary of what we chatted about, some resources for you and our next steps together. In the video where I summarize what we talked about, I usually have the email itself up and I'm saying, hey, it was so great to chat with you. This is this email. This is what it looks like. This is what we talked about. Let me know if I missed anything or if something's inaccurate. This is the resource section and here are our next steps. That way, if they don't want to watch the video and they want to read it instead, it, it's both there for them. So you're giving options. I think there is one particular example you gave as well, like when you were talking about uh, specific integration with Salesforce, for example. So uh, like if, if that comes up in a, in a call, like you could say, hey, I've created a video to show you how that works. And yes. that's much nicer. And here's the documentation that's 45 <laughs> pages long that you can read when you go to bed this evening, you know? And I mean, <laughs> it's, I, I think in, in that case, you just need to be a little bit clever about, okay, how can I make things easy 
for my prospect. Like you said it perfectly, Rava, like I wrote it down here, organize the chaos in their head. And by like, by offering something that's going to be taking the sting out of like something that's probably normally quite boring. Like, Hey, you can read up on all of our open API call. Like, I mean, people don't really, no. unless, no. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> so here's a 30 second video that compresses all of that, you know, all of that 45 yes. pages of integration material into 30 seconds. And you can have a watch of that instead, you know, yeah. and that's solving a problem. So, uh, right. Yeah. And if it's hard for you, it's harder for them. And it's your oh, job sure. to make it easy. So you need to figure it out. And um, I would say that this kind of gets into the other situation where if we've got sales reps on the call, I'm sure you've been here before. You have a champion. They're 100% on board. They would sign with you today if they could. They need to get other people on board. And you might not have access to these people. They're having regular one-on-ones. They're having regular, not hallway conversations anymore, but you know, um, like off the cuff conversations. And if you're expecting them to be an expert in what you sell, good luck because that, that message around what you're solving for them and how you're going to help and how you're better than your competitor, that's going to get watered down. And again, you're putting way too much work on your champion to take the conversation you had two weeks ago and try to explain to the person who holds the budget, for instance, why this is a good investment. So make sure the message doesn't get watered down by telling it through video and just saying, hey, in your next one-on-one, -on -one, just play this video for your manager. And this will probably give them a really good overview of what we talked about. That's making it really simple. All right, so um, this is also like, you can see here on the bottom, like there's some bubbles that are highlighted. The, this is really good for after that initial meeting, the follow-ups um, towards the end of closing a deal as well. You could do like walkthroughs of pricing information. And I saw a few people in the chat mention they are doing this, but walking through like common questions or areas that people are like, well, what does that line item mean? That can be very helpful to stop the back and forth and get your deal closed maybe five days sooner than it would have without video. Um, so that's another a way to use it. I'll go to the next slide. I don't know if I have, you could also drive for me. Oh, there we go. Um, so yeah, that gets into this, this area where you, you know, you're at that point where you're proposing a, a solution that's going to work, walk through it, put it in video, maybe walk through it ahead of the meeting so that they can consume it and then they can come to that meeting with questions and you're all on the same page. You're moving your deal forward asynchronously, but still using live meetings. You don't want video to be a crutch where you're no longer having live meetings because that's bad news, but you want it to move your deal forward. Um, something else that video lends itself well to is the idea of stakeholder outreach. So you always want to be multi-threaded in your deal. That might mean having your VP of sales reach out at some point or your CEO or someone on your team to kind of bolster your deal. Having your VP of sales send a text-based email or send like a 30 second, hey, it's Dan here. I know you're evaluating XYZ. Let me know if you have any questions, like would love to chat peer to peer and have him send that out to their VP. So now you're kind of multi-threading your deal and putting different faces. And if you're doing that and your competitor's not, just think about how nice of a experience that is to, to get personal videos from multiple people at the company. Um, and here it says, you know, make it impossible to say no. So definitely. Um, okay. so. <laughs> <laughs> now getting into the last type of video, and this kind of harks back to the, the initial one, but a handoff and introduction again. So once someone has signed on with you, they're about to start their partnership, that might be the end of it for you as a net new sales rep. But for that com company, that's the beginning of their relationship with your company. So make it really nice, make it personal, put the effort in that you put in the whole time to get them signed. A great way is to have um, a little handoff to their customer success manager or maybe to their launch team, whoever that next step might be. Um, this was obviously recorded while we were in the office, but Zoom is a great way to do it. Get on Zoom, go into gallery mode, record 
record yourself saying, hey, it was so great chatting with you. This is going to be your customer success manager. They're going to be booking a meeting with you next week, you know, making them know what comes next. So that's the kind of last tactical example I'll give you of how video can help in your in the full cycle of your sales. They're really good tips, Reva. Thank you for that. It's been super interesting. One of the things you just mentioned there with the with the picture of the guys here with the background of the office was actually one of the questions that came up uh, a couple of minutes ago, just I think even when Morgan was speaking before was, you know, when you're recording video nowadays with everybody working remotely, what do you recommend like background wise? Uh, so like, what do you do as, as somebody that uses video day in, day out? Like what, what's your backdrop? Yeah, I'll say like you're looking at it. I like the authentic feeling of this. You can see I'm working from home. I've seen people have like the stand up signs of their company. Like you've got lead feeder in the background. That's awesome. I think that's great too. Some people use the virtual backgrounds. My personal opinion is I don't like them. I think that they look kind of they look too markety to me, or sometimes they don't come through properly. Like when you move, you can tell it's virtual. So, but if that's what you like, go for it. I'd love to hear what Morgan thinks too. Yeah, I'm I'm not a fan of the virtual background if it's your logo, because it's more about you and not about them. And that's fair. Even, even working with clients, like no one's ever been like, yeah, they loved our background. <laughs> so, so like my thing is like, <laughs> My thing is something isn't impactful and it's not moving the needle and it's neutral, then it is what it is. And if you can, and if you're not getting any feedback or negative feedback, then definitely don't do it. Right. So I would say on the backgrounds, like where I'll say it's been beneficial for people that have told me that they've used them is when it's like their company look like not the company that they work at, but like the company they're going after, like their logo, like something that is about them, like a background that they care about. Maybe they did research and found out that they were a, on a sports fan and they had like that team's logo in the back. Like that, that to me makes sense. But if it's yes. your company logo, it's, it's very markety. And I, and I, and I haven't again, heard a lot of great feedback where someone's like, yo, that logo's crazy. So like <laughs> that, that's, that's where I would, that's like my thing about it. I think as long as you keep a normal white background maybe you have stuff in the background like i do or you know annie does for example or Reva, right so Let like just I, that's hide that logo there yeah yeah <laughs> right. I know, this perfectly white background <laughs> right <laughs> so that that's that's my take on it i think the more human you can make your video and your approach the better we're already in a virtual work from home situation and i think everyone can understandably know what everyone's at at this point so i don't think it needs to be over the top uh, I, I agree with you there. Like, it's, it's funny. It, de it depends. And it also goes back to this humor thing as well. We've got one guy on our, on our team he's based out of the U S and uh, he's, he's actually, it's, it's his humor, you know, it's, he's a, he's, a, he's a lighthearted guy and, and he's got a good sense of humor. So he always puts himself in this like super corporate backdrop of like a proper boardroom and that he's sitting at the top of like a, a proper boardroom <laughs> table, you know? We're like a small lead feeder logo in the back. And it's so ridiculous that people actually laugh at it. <laughs> <laughs> so it actually, it, it works in his favor. Now that's not going to work for everyone. And that's a, that's a humorous thing. But uh, but just actually to touch on your on your content on this particular handoff and, and introduction piece, Reva, I think this is really great for, for like even helping customer success reduce churn. You know, like if we're like, okay, I could, let's talk about it in lead feeder's perspective. We're, we, we work with like, thousands and thousands of customers so we're like a velocity model we've got a, a huge amount of customers which means that um when we're doing handovers like our, our our customer success team maybe don't get a like a massive amount of time to spend with each of their customers they do have they've got a huge amount of customers they need to go through but they uh because we've got so many customers to look after they maybe don't get that much time as you would in for example enterprise sales where you probably have five or six major customers that you're looking after Whereas our CS guys, customer success guys, will have hundreds, right? right. Um, and to be able to increase that sort of personal touch between the person that you were dealing with initially in the deal and to be given over to somebody else that's not a salesperson anymore can sometimes, even if you're in an enterprise setting, it feels a little bit disjoint and you're like, hey, but I've been working with you and I like you. Yeah. And now you're giving me to somebody else I don't have a relationship with. Where are you going? You know, right. like that, and that's, that's typically what happened. And 
even in our perspective, like to, to try to build the relationships even harder because you don't have as many, you don't have as many touch points with your CS person then. So like for us, even a lead feeder to be able to have that sort of like almost building a personal connection bridge immediately by doing that, I think it's really cool. I think it's a really good idea. That's awesome. And, and this can, again, depending on how you're aligned to your CSM org, can be a one-to-many video. So if you do want to, um, rec- if, you're, if you're in high velocity and you don't have time to make a video every single time, I think you probably could, but um, you could say, you know, hey, great working with you. This is Morgan. He's going to be your main point of contact moving forward. You're in great hands. And just send that over and over and over again. It still has your face and that personal feel. But you got to find what works for you. Is it one-to-one or is it one-to-many? Yeah, for sure. Okay, well, uh, you've got this uh, last slide here, Reva, that I'll hand over to you. Yeah, yeah. So really, this is just a summary of we are all digital first now. How can you make asynchronous work for you to to move your deals along. It's not, the idea is not to replace live meetings with video. The idea is to use video to keep your prospect engaged and educated, help them not ghost you and help make it easy to partner with with you. So it's like, where are you going to use video? You don't need to use video everywhere in your sales cycle, but think about a couple places that you think you could use it where it could propel your deal forward. For sure. For sure. I think, yeah, I think there's, there's a certain amount of overdoing it. It's the same with anything, you know, if, if people overdo it, you're like, come on, man, you know, calm down. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> just, it, it's, it's, it's about balance really across the entire journey. And I think uh, if you, if you're being balanced, um, if you, I, I personally, for me, I think you should try to be as personalized as possible in any approach. Like you try to fit it as best you can to the person that you're dealing with, because as the recipient of these things, I think it's uh, it's very clear when people haven't put any any type of effort into being personal. Um, but uh, like I I think like some really really good points there as well, Reba. So th- thank you for that great content. So uh, guys, we have like we have a couple of minutes left now for Q and A. There's been a number of questions come up uh, throughout as well, but w- which we've answered. But like let's maybe um, go through uh, some of the ones that I have here. So. Um, does your experience show that video works better for certain industries and or demographics? So in this case, this is from Andy Wagner. He said, uh, selling to B2B distributors or manufacturers sometimes feels like a time warp back to the 1990s. <laughs> <laughs> How effective do you, do you think video would be in these scenarios? You could send them a VHS, you know what I mean? <laughs> no. but, can, I, can, I share, can I share my screen real quick? Over. Over. I'll answer this quickly. This is actually, fr- this is from Vidyard, I believe. So Viva, this will be similar data here. So this will answer. Let me see if I can. I th- yeah, there can you, you go. see it? You got it. Yeah, we got All it. All right, cool. This answers everybody's question. So you'll see right here that it gives you a breakdown. This was back in 2020 when they did it, but it's probably the most recent data that we currently have. So I would take it as that. And you'll see the, essentially the percentage points of how the much the engagement is and adopt basically the the, the the additions of what's happening in that industry. So what you're seeing here is how they're adopting basically video. So you'll see that on the internet software services side, there's a 19%. You'll see on the education, there's a 7%. You see manufacturing is an 8%. So these are percentages that you can look at based on the respondents and based on, hey, like this is how you know, they want to engage and receive video just according to what they got. So I don't know, I know this is in your study. So I don't know if you can add more context to it, but I, I saw this and this is what I share with people when they're like, oh, does this work in my industry? Like this is the best data I found on it to give everyone an understanding of what is happening and just the percentage points and what you can be looking at when you're going out and looking at video and things of that nature. Yeah, I'll add that our, um, our CEO said it really well and I'll probably botch the the delivery but the pandemic caused everyone regardless of industry to fast forward in digital transformation by 10 years overnight and so whether you were ready or not we all kind of took a leap forward and um regardless of where we go in the next few years these digital transformations are here to stay people are going to get used to communicating in this way um at Vidyard, I'll say we've had a lot of interest of, 
of industries where we didn't really see a lot of people raise their hand before wanting to use video. They need to figure out, they used to be these old industries like manufacturing and big ticket items that you're selling. They relied heavily on like face-to-face -face interaction and going out and meeting their prospects. If you're selling a million dollar deal um, of like manufacturing equipment, you're probably meeting in person. And so um, if you're selling to those organizations, they're going through a digital transformation right now too. Yep, 100%. I, uh, I think uh, that's actually a very good point. That digital transformation thing overnight is insane. Like <laughs> how, many, how many companies are running around with their heads on fire still <laughs> after after that Lost. after that one year you know <laughs> it's 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 insane and but it's it's only gonna it's like i think it's only gonna get more solidified i think there's going to be more services out there to help people get more digitally transformed as well i think the tools that everybody's using are going to get more simplified in terms of how to get them up and running the resources that are out there to enable people to understand the technologies that are, are going to get better like I think it's it has accelerated, and I think there's a lot of catching up that needs to happen, especially in the resource side of things. So, uh, to to go back to Andy's point there, Andy Wagner's point around like if he's working in this industry that's that's sort of caught in the '90s almost, like that industry it will have to catch up. You know, it's 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 inevitable. But Andy, I I do appreciate where you're coming from, and that I used to work in a space that was very, very old school. Like it was the, the, I'd say the typical person working in that space was sort of 60 years old and male, right? And it, it was tough to, to do anything that was somewhat creative. But I think I'm seeing now quite a bit, even on LinkedIn, that people that would have come from that space that I was in before are coming out with super creative stuff that's actually matching to that profile. So if you're saying that, you know, you're still, it's time work back to the 90s, what was interesting to people that are stuck in that era, you know? And I'm seeing that with this industry that I used to work in, that the marketers there are actually sort of embracing that a little bit and just being like, okay, maybe I can put a little bit of humor into this, or maybe I can take something which is a bit relevant to that specific, that specific piece yep. and make that as part of my outreach. Um, and, you know, it may not work. They may struggle to, to comprehend the video piece. But if you try to personalize it back to that, it will or should put your foot forward in the right direction. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, there's a question here from, from Christoph. Uh, how do you end video? Like, uh, what are some cool learnings, tips, except for like a, a regular CTA, like making sure the prospect leaves the video with a smile or a great feeling? My favorite is the, like, uh, I don't know if anyone's read the gong survey, but of what CTA actually works the best. Is it the, do you have 30 minutes to chat? Which uh, surprise, surprise is not the one that works the best. So uh, ending with something a bit more along the lines of, does this sound like something that would be worth chatting about further? That's always a, a safe one to end on the prospecting side. I would say on when you're using video, because the topic of this webinar is like, full cycle sales use, use of video. Um, at, the, at that point, you're educating and engaging an already engaged audience. And so you're probably booking that next meeting on your call, but maybe you're confirming the meeting still works. Maybe you're confirming, is this information accurate or would you change anything? Um, so your CTA is changing slightly to more of a in the sales cycle CTA. That makes sense. Morgan, what do you think, mate? I, I don't think it's more so on the call to action to make them smile. I think it's what you do at the beginning that's going to make them smile and engage. So making sure that you're doing the research, making sure that you're bringing up something. I, I think what people, what really stands out to people is like the first bit of that video. I don't have any unique call to actions that get people to get super fired up. I'm, my whole goal is in the beginning to get them fired up so they watch the whole thing. So I would just go with what Riva said and what we've talked about quite a bit here is using the interest call to actions. Like, would you be open to learning more? Curious to take a deeper dive, those things of that should get the prospect to smile because most people to Riva's point ask for 30 minutes and it's an eye roll. So if you do anything outside of that, it's going to make them smile because it's not going to be the thing they always get. <laughs> 
Yeah, you can even address that point and say, hey, I'm not going to ask you for a 30-minute call here. I'm going to ask you to do this instead. There's <laughs> yeah. the humor. There's you the humor. To call it out. <laughs> exactly. People, people exactly. appreciate it. People appreciate it. Yeah. I think generally, though, from I think, look, it, it, there's going to be different things work on different people. I think there's going to have to be a certain level of testing on things. It depends on so many different factors, what industry you're selling into, who's the who are the personas that you're targeting, what's of interest to them. Like it, it, there's so many influencing things. And I think the best way to do it is just to start, see what resonates, see what works, then double down on that. That's the same across everything. That's, that's you know, this is like sales almost being in marketing positions that they're marketing themselves and marketing the brand. And in marketing, we tend to test if it works, double down, but we do a huge amount of testing and a huge amount of our testing doesn't work by the way. So that's, yes. that's also something yeah. to bear in mind. Like the majority <laughs> of the tests don't work. So, you know, we end up trashing that and then bringing something new in that does work, you know, but uh, we have a, we have a couple more questions here. So um, Phil Robertson asked a very good question just around selling sort of intangible services like translation, right? So he's, I think Phil probably sells uh, translation services. Like, do you have any tips for him in terms of how best he could sell translation services via video? Well, I, I, I sell an intangible. So, yeah. okay. there you um, go. <laughs> so at the, at the end of the day, like, I, I think when selling an intangible, it's actually best to do video because you, you, you don't have anything to show. So at least they can see you, right? Cause it's definitely got to buy into what you're saying. So the best way to really go about this is to do a, if you can do a round table of clients you currently have, and then have them talk about the challenges and the priorities that they currently have in the ecosystem and then take those challenges and priorities and then figure out like, okay, like what do these people even care about? Because you don't have a product to show, but what you're really trying to do is one, figure out what is a pleasure point for them. And all, what, all that means at the end of the day is what gets them excited? Like what's about translation? I don't know what that is, but your clients do. And then two is what are like the problems? Like what are some obstacles they have? You could talk to that. So when selling an intangible, it really is talking to the clients, figuring out what they care about, reverse engineering that to then make your videos. And that, that's what I did in April when everything was going crazy. I just hit up my clients and I was like, all right, like what, what's happening? What are the problems? What are the priorities? Like, I know that you probably don't know everything that's happening, but you at least have some sort of understanding. And that's how I created my talk track to then reach out to people that wasn't annoying. It was relevant information because being relevant is really important, especially right now. I think that's awesome. I wouldn't add anything to that. I think that's really good advice. And I also think that, uh, Morgan, are you not at your LinkedIn limit? I don't think anyone can add you on LinkedIn. Yeah, you, you, no one can add me on LinkedIn. So you can follow him. Uh, follow him on LinkedIn. Morgan. Morgan yeah, I'm Morgan. at the limit, man. They're not. You know what's worse? Uh, I had to tell would, someone at LinkedIn that I was at the limit. And they were like, oh, and I was like, yeah, maybe you should fix it. Oh, man. I can't Link accept you. <laughs> So follow Morgan on LinkedIn. Uh, Morgan, it's, I still find that crazy that, that you hit the limit. And this has actually been been uh, the case for quite a while, actually, right? When, when did it's you actually been, hit it's that? Been like, it's been like, uh, I hit it in May. So it's been like, what, eight months? Stop being so right. damn popular, Morgan. That's the problem. <laughs> You're too damn popular, man. Hey, look. <laughs> you can still add me. <laughs> And me, and me, the seven reader, like we're welcoming you guys with open arms. <laughs> um, look, uh, like we'll finish on 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 uh, one more question from Jennifer Thompson. Just uh, any thoughts on the effectiveness of sending videos to the C-suite? So people like C-level executives, so CEOs, CMOs, chief revenue officers. Any stats on how often the C-suite will watch videos versus other employees? Do you guys have any experience there? Yeah, right there's now. yeah, there's lots of um, I think HubSpot came out with a study on the C-suite in particular, but you got to break it down to this. The C-suite, they're humans too. They want to laugh. They want to watch a video instead of read an email. They like the reason video works is naturally it appeals to our human brain. We want visual and we can we can absorb more when we're watching a video and hearing the content than just reading a text-based email. So always dumb it down to that, that maybe your messaging is going to be a bit different. Maybe you're going to talk about what the C-suite cares about, I would hope, but video should still work no matter who you're selling to. Yeah, I, I, 
I agree with that so much. And I, and I want you all to even think about this as well, is that an executive gets a hundred sales emails a day. Most of those emails are not good. And that's me being nice. <laughs> so if, if all of those emails that say, hope all is well, hope you're doing great, whatever the heck it says, that's not good. If you were to make a video to someone in the C-suite, they would appreciate you a lot. And if you use the language that we've been talking about today, not everyone's going to click it, right? But you will have more people click it because people are intimidated in talking to someone in the C-suite. It's why people don't cold call the C-suite. And if I ask you how many cold calls you get, it's probably super low compared to how many emails and LinkedIn spam in mails you get. It's <laughs> probably a, a the ridiculous, number. ridiculous. So I'll tell you now, I sometimes like probably every six months, I put something on LinkedIn saying, will people please cold call me <laughs> because like, <laughs> exactly. I don't know if I'm doing something wrong or like, <laughs> but like, I have not gotten caught. This is not an invitation for people to call. call. <laughs> <laughs> but I have not been cold called in months, but I get at least five to six really bad LinkedIn requests a day. In that yeah. like people send me LinkedIn requests 20 seconds later, here's my 12 paragraph pitch via in mail. And I, do you know what I do with that? If I connect with them, cause I normally connect with everybody. Cause I'm trying to be like you, Morgan. I'm trying to reach my limit, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I do connect with people. But if I get that, I disconnect with them immediately. I'm like, you so oh, you're never gonna is... get there. No. <laughs> <laughs> is that your secret, Morgan? <laughs> <laughs> no, but so I, I think yeah, it's it's uh yeah, like I honestly like there's so much junk outreach that's non-personalized that's just. You know, like, but if somebody sends me something that's that's interrupts me, interrupts my day in a good way, then I'm definitely going to reach back out to them. And I think video is a great way to do that because really I get so much junk into my inbox, my email inbox, LinkedIn inbox the same. But like, uh, if somebody does something a little bit different, I notice it. And uh, it, but but not many people do that different thing. I think because they're afraid to do it. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with posting stuff on LinkedIn. Very very few people are are willing to put a video of themselves on LinkedIn, for example, or even post, even post a post. Like I think the majority of LinkedIn users, if you looked at their activity, would be liking or, or sharing other people's stuff, but not actually putting themselves out there that much. Don't know what you guys think. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I mean, it's, it's something that's completely new. It's something that you're putting yourself out there. It's the fear of getting rejected, the fear of wasting time. At the end of the day, what I always tell people is that if it doesn't work, you're still in the same spot. Yeah. You you're go. still, you're still in the same spot, right? Yeah. Now you can, now you can have confidence and say, this does not work for me, but until mm -hmm. you do it, you can't say, Oh, it doesn't work for me, but you've never done it. it logically doesn't make any sense. Right. So like, that's how I see it. You're going to be in the same spot regardless. You might as well try it because that, that thing you do could lead to 200, 300% of what your quota is. Mm -hmm. Very good advice. Okay, uh, so guys, look, we're after going over and I'm wary of everybody's time. I still see we nearly have 100 people on. So everybody, thank you so much for staying on until the end. But uh, guys, Morgan, Reva, thank you so much. Thank you so much for putting together this really great content. I'm sure people are able to take a lot away from it. Uh, guys, just one more time before we finish up, like if people are interested in downloading that ebook, uh, we will send out another link in the next day or so. But uh, some really good content in there as well, also from Vidyard and uh guys it's been really great like great interactivity as well from the audience everybody getting involved i'm glad that everybody found their seat at the start i was a bit concerned about that you know, early on. <laughs> i'm glad they found but, their seat you know? it's gonna be mean, tough. let's get to the most important parts here about you know people found their seats so that's you know <laughs> my job here is done really but uh no but guys uh reva morgan thank you so much and and also thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to share uh, share these great nuggets of wisdom thank you so much Awesome. Great. You guys have a Thanks, good one. Thanks, everyone. Cheers, guys. Take it easy. Bye-bye.